Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Interviews with Aurobillians. This morning, part two with Loretta. Namaste. Namaste. So you, I wanted to ask you one question. You had um, named yourself, you had given yourself a name of Sadhana. Oh, yes. Could you tell us about that? Of course I can. Of course I can. No, I didn't name myself and I didn't ask for a name. Ah. I was in one ashram near the bank of the Ganges between Rishikesh and Lakshmanjula and I was doing the usual trying to serve the Guru in my own clumsy Western way. And one day, well, he wasn't my Guru, he was like the Swami. And he said, I am going to call you Sadhana, your name is Sadhana. So I said, okay. <laughs> and it wasn't so significant, but it was nice. So when I arrived, I, that was a name that I had. And so I just told everyone, this is my name, Sadhana. And then I began to feel uncomfortable with the name. It didn't seem right. So I wrote to Mother and I told her about the name and I said, what should I do? She said, leave the name. So I left it. Oh. And, and I could have asked for another name, but I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. I just went back to the name that I had. Wonderful. So now we were talking about uh, the third, the fourth time we met Mother. And then your work in the kitchen of the Matrimandia workers' camp. What did you do after that? Well, I will tell you how I learned that I did what Mother asked. Because Mother said, first, to be an Oramillion, you have to fix the kitchen at the Matrimandia. So, I, one point, at one point, I found some uh, do you, you remember the camp, of course. Very well. The, the, the keep roofs were like big teepees, oh, yes. and, and up in the, in the top of the triangle hung light bulbs. Mm -hmm. So one day I found these Japanese paper globes, and I covered the light bulbs. And from that time, I started to sense there was something living up there in the keep. I could feel it. Mm. So it was a beautiful presence. I really liked it. And I decided it was an angel. And I got more and more curious about it. And finally, I went back to see Madhav Pandit to ask Madhav Pandit what it was. So I described it to him. And he said, you know, he said, when Mother gives a work, she puts an emanation there in the work. You, you know about this. Okay, this is the first I had heard about it. No, you can speak about it. Okay, Mother, from when she did this, of course I know not when, besides myself, she would put an emanation of herself. And Sri Aurobindo explains it in, in his letters, that it is actually the Mother herself, an emanation of the Mother herself. And it's to help the work. And let me tell you, I needed help <laughs> doing, doing the kitchen with... Um, I, we spoke 17 languages in the camp. I once yeah. counted that. Really? Yes, we spoke 17 languages. Yeah. Everyone came from their own culture. None of us were expert yogis. There, there were always this problem, that problem. It was always hard, and Mother was always there. You remember Rude Loman? Of course I remember Rude Loman. Talk about him a little bit, the memory of him. Not many people have spoken of him. Rude was a very serious guy. He had the room next to yours. You were in the corner and he was, was, was next to yours. Um, he talked quietly and seriously, and I didn't have any conversations with him. I, he kept to himself. But I remember when, um, when he was with Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I remember how, how she adored him. Yes. I remember he'd be working on the Machamandir, and Barbara would just be sitting there, and she'd be adoring Rude. It was very beautiful. I'm sorry, I actually have no idea. Do you remember when Madhav used to come out once a week 
to talk to us in that little meditation room? I do. I have a memory of sitting there and not understanding a word he said. I Believe me, I understood nothing at all. It, it was, for me, it was just all a beautiful white light where Mother was there, and I knew there was a new world, and I knew new people were coming. And I used to sit, there was the, the, uh, the dining room had one opening in the keat that was the doorway in. Mm. And I used to sit in the doorway, and there was, there was nothing. There wasn't a blade of grass. There was, was nothing. And the, on the red earth, there was a red road that curved away. And I actually used to sit there and think that I would see a group of the new people walking up the road and coming to the camp. Well, now we're in the mid-70s. We are. We are in, um, in let me think, actually, no, do you know what? I'm going to go back just slightly because I had a very unique experience with Mother's passing. Oh. And I left the camp after that. So oh, okay. I want to tell, Surely. Uh, this is something really extraordinary. When you do kitchen work, you are tied to the kitchen. You can't, it's a, it's, doesn't happen in small bits. There's, it's, it, it's a really, you have to watch that kitchen all the time. So I didn't go anywhere. Every now and then I would kind of get to the ashram. And it happened on the 17th of November, 1973, I was in the ashram. And I was staying in Golkund. And I had, I slept very well on the 17th. I woke up just feeling especially rested and healthy. It was very early. And I thought, okay, I'll go to the dining hall for the beginning of the breakfast. And I came out of Golconda and I was walking by the wall of the ashram. And a man whom I don't remember came up to me and said, Mother left her body last night. And I said, no. I said, she didn't. No, Mother's never leaving her body. Mother left. I fought with him. No, no, no. Finally, he said, all right. They put her in the meditation hall. Go and see. And this was maybe six, 15, something like, in the morning. In the morning. In the morning. This would be the 18th. Because Mother left at 7.26 p.m. on the 17th. And at that very moment, the small team who were concreting the very last completed. of the four pillars completed the work. And Piero told me that he usually didn't check the time, but for some reason he looked at the watch. And it was 7.26. And that was the moment Mother left. So I went into the samadhi, and it looked like business as usual. There, nobody was rushing to them. There was nothing. I thought, the guy's wrong. Nothing's happening. I went into the meditation hall, and there was Mother. She would, they had brought her down, and the bed that's still there, and there she was. And there was, there was no barrier. There was, I think, no cushions or anything on the floor, no, no cloth, no. just Mother. And she was like this. She's yeah, leaning forward. Half bent over. Half bent over, but it felt to me like total surrender. It felt, felt like, like a, a t position of total surrender. And I had read a, a couple of things here and there where Mother had talked about what was she going to do if she left the body. And one of them was that she would take everything with her. And when I looked at her, it was like everything had been sucked out of her. There was nothing in that body. It was like a soft, empty shell. You know, and she was leaning over like this. And I stood there, and I stood there, and I tried to feel anything that I knew of as mother in these basically three and a half years. And I couldn't feel anything. <laughs> and I stood there, and I stood there, and I stood there. And I began to hear the room began to vibrate. And we could hear like a humming. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You remember that? Oh, yes. Well, I remember when it kind of, I became first aware of it, very light. Mm -hmm. And nothing, this vastness. 
and nothing. And then the mother is standing there. Nobody came. And I stood there. And I stood there. And nobody came. And nobody came. And nobody came. And I and then this humming got louder and louder and the room was vibrating and vibrating. Then I heard two words inside. I heard I heard two words. Eternal contact. And I said those words to myself over and over again. Eternal contact. Eternal contact. And then I got really hungry. I couldn't stand it anymore. I didn't want to leave, but I was really hungry. I ran to the dining hall. I didn't speak to a soul. I ate some food. I ran back. Nobody was in that room. Can you believe? I stood there alone with Mother, and I don't know how long. I mean, it was the end of, of the dining hall, so I'd been there for, um, I don't know if that's an hour that the dining hall's open. But I came back, and, and then, of course, I was really into standing there, you know, and I didn't want anybody to come. And meanwhile, the room was like vibrating. Mm -hmm. Finally, from Mother's room, came down the steps three or four people, and they looked very small. They were kind of coming down the steps. And I made myself very small, and I hope they didn't see me, because I didn't want to leave. And I stood there, and finally one came over, I think it was a man, and he said, would you mind leaving now? We want to do some things with Mother. And I left. And I turned around, I walked out of the Samadhi, I got my things from Golconda, and I went home. I never thought about if they would, I never thought anything. If they would put mother in the samadhi or that I should be there, I, I never thought anything. And I didn't say anything to anybody. I just went home. And mother was, was gone, but nothing changed for me, except that, of course, there were no darshans. But I was the same. I did my kitchen work. And I talked to Mother all day long, complaining about this, talking about that, just that relationship. And, and then, m many months later, it was about a year later, 74, I put those, those paper lampshades, mm -hmm. and I went to see Madhav, and Madhav said to me, Mother puts an emanation and when the work is successful, that emanation manifests. So what you feel at the top of the dining hall is that emanation of mother has manifested because the work is successful. So I had completed the job that mother gave me to fix the kitchen at the Madhavendra Workers' Camp. What did you do from then on in Oroville? Well, I didn't. I didn't. I left very soon after that. Oh. And even that was very magical. All this, everything I'm telling you, which was a fabric of my life and the life that I lived, when I say it and I look back on it, it's very magical. Um, I had friends in the ashram and somehow I was uncomfortable in Oroville. And one day I was talking to an old ashramite and I said, I don't feel comfortable. Something's wrong. I'm not comfortable. He said, well, if you're not happy, why don't you leave? And I left. I packed up my things the next day, and I left. I walked out. And I never told a soul. I don't know if you were there at the time that I just disappeared what from the year? kitchen. 74. Oh, yeah, sure. I was already in the nursery. OK, OK, well, well, um, I didn't think about, it was really, again, like leaving America. I didn't think about what I left behind me. I just thought about what was in front of me. And the next day, after I left, the whole problem with society erupted into violence. Yes. And I never heard one word about it. Can you believe? I never heard one word. I, I, Mother spared you. She spared me. I, my being was not for that, and I don't think I could have handled it. Mary Ellen couldn't? Yes. yes. She had to leave? Yes. She left in 80. She withstood it for six years. Well, 
and she was a delicate soul. I understand her mother protected you. How long did you stay in the U.S.? Well, I didn't go to the U.S. right away. Ah. I went into Golkot. I lived, I stayed in the ashram for three and a half years. Oh, I thought you said you had left. I you left. Just left Oroville. I left Oroville. Ah, okay. And then you lived in Golkon for three and a half years. I wasn't in Golkon the whole three and a half years. I had an apartment. All these things were just given to me. Nothing was ever difficult. I lived. I lived above the ashram exhibition hall where uh, Richard Pearson mm -hmm. lives now. Yes. And then from there I went into Golkon, and. That is the most wonderful time I ever had in my life. I can imagine. That Golkund. I had... Um, I spent many years there. Two East Six was my room. It was my room. And every time I walked out the door, Mother was in the hallway. And Mother was everywhere in Golkund. And I felt Mother everywhere, and it was just Mother in Golkund. And I, I, as an I, Mother granted my wish, then I got to go back to my art, and I painted from Savitri. I did a series of paintings. I would, I would take the book, as Mother says, that you do when you want counsel and guidance. You ask and you open the book and you get guidance on the page. And I would see a vision of whatever was on the page, and I would paint it. And most remarkably, I did not even know about Huta that she had made these paintings. Oh. I've always lived in this very small um, uh, fairyland <laughs> with mother, motherland. And, and I, so I, I did a series of, there were like Indian miniatures on, you know, the, the handmade paper makes these blocks of painting paper. Yes. In those days they did, I did them. And later, when I saw Huta's paintings, I had been given exactly the same pictures that Huta had, because a very large percentage of my paintings were exactly the same thing that Huta had painted. Where are they now? The paintings were, we had, when I did go back to the States, they were destroyed in the big earthquake, but I have slides. I have copies, I have, I have photographic copies of, of the paintings. So that's what I did. I had, and can you believe that I painted in my room in Golkund? That requires a little explanation. Um, when, when Mother built Golkond, she put Mona Pinto in charge of Golkond, the most wonderful, big-hearted English woman, very stern, very righteous, very strong. And Golkond rules to today, in fact, are absolutely strong. You obey the Golkond rules. And I must say, that living in Golkan gave me all my good habits in life. You know, coming as a sloppy old American, um, I learned how to be a very clean and neat person in Golkan because of the Golkan rules. And you couldn't do anything in Golkan. You couldn't touch the walls. And the reason you could not touch the beautiful walls is they were made of a kind of ground seashells. And they were plastered. And this was done in the days when there were people who knew this ancient craft and that was gone. And they were great artists. They were great artists, and Golkhand is so pristinely fabulous. And so you couldn't sit against the wall, you couldn't put your hand against the wall, you couldn't touch anything, and I was painting in there. And um, they told Mona I was painting in there. She never spoke to me, she said, leave her alone, let her paint. She said, Leave her alone. Let her paint. Can you believe? And at one point... Well, I, I can believe it because she told me I had total freedom in the roller coaster. Did she really? Yeah. You had total freedom? Yeah. Nara can go any place at any time. Wow. That's what she... We were very close friends. Yes. Yes. Me too. Me too. But we're her. not here for my story. <laughs> for yours. Okay. Yeah, at one point... I had these big, you know, the big sheets of paper from the handmade paper factory. I mm. took clothespins. Watercolor I, paper? Watercolor paper. And I didn't use oils. And I pinned them on the door. <laughs> and I stood with the open door painting in the middle of Golgot. I look back and I just think, how extraordinary. But, you know, what a blessing. And then, after three and a half years, Mother tricked me out. Mm. 
she, it was a scheme. <laughs> because I was totally happy. I would never have, ever have left. But somehow, I got kind of like bored with everything. Everything seemed to dry up, I don't know. And I began to think about visiting my family in the States. It had been nine and a half years, two plane tickets gone. <laughs> And I wrote, and I said, I think I'll come for a visit. And we came with the third plane ticket. You? The third plane ticket came. So I, the owner told me I could not keep, store my things in Golkan. She never let anybody. Mm -hmm. I, to, so I had an ashramite friend, and actually I didn't have much to store. And I brought back with me paintings. I thought, not, not the Sabitri paintings to sell, but other, I'd done a lot of sumie, a lot of flowers, and I, th and I thought, if I sell the paintings, I'll make enough money, I can come back for the rest of my life. So I went back, and I was visiting, my, I came with my mother to San Francisco to visit my brother. I'm walking around the streets of San Francisco, and I become aware that I'm hearing a sound like a bell ringing, ting, 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 and thinking, what is this sound? And I open to listen to the sound, and it's mother's voice. Mm. Mother's voice. And I hear mother's voice. And I knew mother's voice because I had the recording of Mother Reading the Mother by Sri Aurobindo, which I listened to over and over. Mother's voice is extremely familiar. And Mother was saying, what? She was saying, stay, 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 stay. <laughs> and I said, I'm not staying. <laughs> no, I can't, no, Mother, I'm not. Stay. Say, no, I can't stay. I'm going back. I don't want to be here. I go come to my home. I fought with her for three days. Three days. And finally, I really thought, she has given me everything I have. She is my whole life. Everything I ever wanted. Now the first time she's telling me to do something that I don't want to do. I cannot say no. It was honor. It was a point of honor. I can't say no. So I stayed. Wasted the other half of the third plane ticket. And, and then, of course, I had to do something. By then, I'd sold all the, the secular paintings. They'd, I'd gone, I'd had gallery shows. Where, where were these? This was in Los Angeles. Oh. I was staying with my mother in her apartment in Sherman Oaks, a suburb oh, yes. of Los yes, Angeles. Know it well. Okay. And um, I mean, I was ready to go back and had no reason to stay. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do? I guess I'd better get a job. No guidance, mind you, from mother. No, you stay here and you do this. And I had been to East West Cultural Center and I met Jyoti Priya, who I loved very, very much. But it wasn't the ashram. And so I didn't go running to East West Cultural Center. And it wasn't what I knew as the ashram, except for Jyoti Priya. So, I, my father, my parents were separated. My father said he would drive me around and help me to get a job. And I wasn't really qualified. I had a bachelor's in mm. fine arts, almost a, a master of fine arts, no training. And who's going to hire, uh, I was 37, who's going to hire an almost middle-aged lady artist from some obscure, unknown ashram somewhere in South India, without skills. So my father came to me one day, he said, look, your brother is a lawyer, and my brother is quite a successful lawyer. And we always thought you were smarter than your brother when you were children. You can be a lawyer. <laughs> I was like, come on, I can't be a lawyer. What are you talking about? I'd be a lawyer. Um, he said, no, he said, instead of leaving you my money when I die, I will send you to law school. 
No, I'm not going to be a lawyer. So I went home to my mother's house and I fought it over. And I thought, well, hey, I can be a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know what I'll be a lawyer. But mind you, I knew nothing. I was all of my life um, a hippie artist child. I wasn't controllable by my parents. I wasn't controllable by anybody. I, I was a child of the 60s and I ran away to India and I never came back. I was, I must say, quite sorrowfully, a big headache to my parents until I came back and entered society as an attorney. And so I had to get into law school and I had to pass the law school admission test. This is the California, California bar is the hardest in the country. The bar exam you need to take when yes. you get out of law school. Yes. But I did, by some miraculous, I was in the 75th percentile of the LSAT, and, but then what law school would want someone like me? I was accepted by a law school that was actually in downtown LA. And when I got the, the paper with the acceptance and I showed it to my father, he wept, <laughs> tears. <laughs> And so I set about going to law school from the ashram. I was freezing cold. In the middle of summer, they had this huge air conditioning and I'd been living in Bondichair. And I found a used old fur coat and I used to sit in my classes with a fur coat on. I was the oldest person in the school and I understood nothing. And they, in law school, what they do, they frighten you into study. Mm. That you sit in the class, and every teacher said this. The teacher says, look to the right of you. Look to the left of you. One of those people will be gone next term. You have to work hard. I suggest you form study groups. So there was a study group. Somehow or the other, there were two young women both just graduated from college, who accepted me as, as their group. And whatever they did, I did not. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. If they stood up, I stood up. If they sat down, I sat down. <laughs> so there I was, in my mother's house, reading these huge case books, and sitting right there on the desk, right at the side, right there, was Sri Aurobindo's presence. And, and there was nothing for me to do about it but to acknowledge it. You know, if you're a devotee, and I mean, I didn't see him physically, but the presence was unmistakable. You are, you know, you're du pranam and you at the Guru's the feet. Photograph? No. It was just there. It was just right there. No, it was not a photograph. You saw his face. I didn't see his face. Felt I felt his absolute presence when I was studying. And there he was, and there was I, reading. I really didn't understand, you know, much of what I read. But I did. I just went on reading. And I've come to the conclusion that somehow or the other, uh, and I'll explain why later, that he and mother had put the idea in my father's head. Because once I went to my father's house, and he showed me, pointed out a particular couch in the den, and he said, you see there? That's where I do my thinking. That's where I get all my ideas. Hmm. And I sort of had, it just came to me that he, he is being influenced by the mother. He's in some kind of his inner thinking. It's like a meditation. And they, I feel that, that, that they did that. So I got through law school. And I actually, what I did is I made a bunch of paintings and I hung them in the, in the hallway of the law. I decorated the law school. And I, God help me, I passed the bar. I, I was the 75th percentile in the law school. I was an average law student. Mm -hmm. And somehow or the other, I passed the bar. And at that time, uh, my mother had a friend who was playing bridge with a, a lawyer, a group that mm -hmm. is lawyer. He was a criminal, a big, very, very big, hotshot, heavy power criminal lawyer. And he needed someone to house sit for his expensive house when he and his wife went on vacations. And so I got that job, and he liked me. So at one point, he asked me if I would be willing to come and work in his office while I was studying for the bar, 
to help his secretary. And he had, you will know this, people from California will know this, his office was across the street from Grauman's Chinese Theater. Oh. I mean, you know, the, the criminal lawyer available to all crime, right there on Hollywood Boulevard, across, <laughs> it was, I could look out my window and there were the dragons. So I was thrown into this world, totally innocent, knowing nothing. And, and so I took the bar, and then they have a, a newspaper where they publish the names of the people who passed. Mm -hmm. So I got the, I had the paper, I had passed, I was in the office, Howard, Howard Beckler, his name was, Howard walked in the front door, I was standing by the secretary's desk, he said, did you pass? I said, yes. He said, here, take this file and go to court. I want you to arraign somebody in criminal court. And that is how I started my legal career. And I went to court, I want you to know, with two huge criminals. And I stood there in the Van Nuys court, the municipal court. They had to enter their plea before the court to start the trial proceedings. And so I just, Your Honor, I'm here with the clients, and my clients plead not guilty, Your Honor, and we set the date. We came out of the courtroom at 9.30 in the morning, and they invited me to go eat lobster. <laughs> I mean, they, they lived in another world. So this is to say that somehow or the other, I, I learned by the sink or swim method law. And, and it was a training. From the beginning, Howard got me um, a job with a government agency that gives appeals, criminal appeals. If you are a criminal in the United States and you are arrested, the Constitution guarantees you the right to a lawyer. If you cannot afford one, you will get one for free. And after your trial, if you want to appeal the result of your trial, you will get an appeals lawyer. And so all of my practice, I did appeals. Uh, including, uh, I filed appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States. This gave me training in the highest level of accurate research you can have. And I had to take the results of my research and argue in front of a panel of learned judges or in front of a jury. And this gave me training in presentation. And what do I do in Oregon? I do research in Mother and Sri Aurobindo, and I do book compilations, which is just like writing a Supreme Court brief, and I give public lectures on Mother and Sri Aurobindo, which is just like presenting something to three judges or to a panel of juries. And so the reason I was sent back, there were a couple, one was for my family, and the other was to give me training in the job that I'd been doing since I came back to Oregon. 